Hi, this is David with David's Tutorials with vlog post number 2308. In today's vlog post, I want to tell you about the great barfly rabbit hunt. Let's get started. Now, the great barfly rabbit hunt had to do with pilot training at Laredo Air Force Base in 1970, probably very early 1970. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about pilot training, but I'm going to tell you a lot more about it in future videos. But in the Air Force in 1969-1970, pilot training consisted of three phases. You went through three different airplanes in these phases. Now, phase number one was in the Air Force's T-41. Now, T-41 is really nothing more than a Cessna 172 with the back seat removed. The thing was painted Air Force gray, it had U.S. Air Force on the side, and that's about all the difference there was to it between that and a standard commercial 172 airplane. Now, we would go out and fly in that airplane, and we would fly until we were competent enough to go up and solo in it. I'm going to tell you a lot more about that in a future video. Then you moved over into phase two, which is in the T-37 aircraft. Now, a T-37 is a twin-engine jet, small jet engines, and it had side-by-side -side seating so the instructor pilot could actually look right over at you and see you as you're sitting there flying the airplane. Of course, as you are brand new in the airplane, you're getting started and you're a little bit scared. But of course, you develop your competency in that airplane to the point that you could go solo and do formation flying and all these other things. And after you finished in the T-37, you could move over into the T-38 aircraft. Now, the T-38 was a twin-engine jet. It was supersonic capable, and it had tandem seating. In other words, the instructor pilot sat in the back seat and the student pilot sat in the front seat. This video vlog is about when we were in T-37s. And I got to tell you a little bit more about what happens in the T-37 program. Now, Laredo Air Force Base was a very busy pilot training base in 1970. And when the students were practicing their landings, now this is the big part of flying an airplane. You got to learn how to land the thing because if you can't land the thing, you might as well not learn anything else. So you got to learn to land it and you practice a lot of landings. Now, one of the ways you practice landings is by what's called a touch and go. Basically, when you come in and you make your approach and you hit the runway, and as soon as you hit the runway, you add the power, and you take off, and you go around and you do it again. You do a lot of touch-and-go practices to practice your landings. Well, to do these touch-and-go landings at Laredo Air Force Base would have clogged up the traffic pattern there a lot more than they needed it to be. So they had an auxiliary airfield out east of Laredo Air Force Base, about 30 miles, just out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of a whole bunch of agricultural fields. And this auxiliary airfield had the code name of Barfly. And don't ask me why they named it that, where they came up with the name, I don't know. And even the people who came up with the name probably don't know where it came from. But this was an auxiliary airport. It had only one runway. And nobody really manned this runway airport except for their daily supervisors. Now, the supervisors would get in an Air Force vehicle and they would drive the 30, 35 miles out to the Barfly Airport and there would be a chain between two iron posts across the driveway going onto there. And the people who were going out there, they had the code to the padlock on this chain and they could unlock the padlock and drive in. And they would drive up to this RSU called a Runway Supervisory Unit which is basically a control tower, except it wasn't exactly a tower more than the extent of the fact that this thing was only about six feet up off the ground. It was on a trailer of some kind, and it was just mounted there, and you'd climb up the ladder to the platform and open the door and go in the control tower, and you could fire it up. It had electricity, so it had radios, and it had flare guns, and it had um, very lights, Basically, it's just a great big old spotlight with either a red or a green lens in front of it in case somebody had their radio out and you could flash them a red light to mean, no, you don't land, or a green light that meant, yeah, you're okay to land right now. So this is what happened. Now, it was the duty of the RSU officers, which is generally one faculty member or instructor pilot and one student pilot to sit in the RSU and watch for several hours as the student pilots came and did their practice touch-and-go landings at the Barfly Airport. And 
The job of the RSU officers was to look at each airplane as they were on final approach, and you had binoculars, or you could just, with your naked eyes, you could see it most times, verify that each plane coming in for a landing had its landing gear down. It's very much frowned upon if you try to land without putting your landing gear down, and also that you had your flaps down. If they had either one of them not in the correct configuration, they'd get on the radio, and when the person said, uh, fog 5-5, five, five, final, you would then get on the radio and say, fog 5-5, five, five, cleared for touch and go. Or, fog 5-5, five, five, landing gear, go around, anything like that. Basically, they made sure that they didn't prang the airplanes onto the runway and damage them or hurt themselves. So that was the duty of the RSU officers. During this time, you probably understand that there's pretty much not very many limits on young 23, 24, 25-year-old kids. I can say that right now. Hey, I'm 76 years old. I can say 25-year-old people are kids, and they were at that time. You just don't have the best judgment as to what's okay to do and what's really not such a good idea. And sometimes people that age think something's a really good idea. Hey, let's do this when it's not such a good idea. This is a vlog about the thing that was probably not the best idea we ever had. But I had a friend named Bruce. He had a big Buick, I believe it was a Buick Electra 225, something like that, a giant boat of a car. He called it his land yacht, and I've adopted that term for the latest car that I just bought. But he was of the kind of person that he bought a model airplane propeller, and he bent a coat hanger and mounted it on his front bumper and grill so that this little model airplane propeller, when he was driving down the road, it would spin. And it was just the kind of fun thing that we all like to do as student pilots and kids of that age. Well, I got together with Bruce and we asked two of our friends, Jim and Kelly, to say, hey, let's go out to to Barfly and just see what's there at night because we had the combination. We'd all been RSU officers and we had the combination to the padlock and we just wanted to go maybe drive down the runway at night and, and have some fun. Well, it turned out both Jim and Kelly brought along a pistol and we didn't know it at the time and we were out there and we got on the runway and we got up to 70 miles an hour. The runway is more than a mile long, probably about a mile and a half, plenty of room and we noticed there were a whole bunch of jackrabbits out there. Well, Jim and Kelly, they got out their pistols and they started plinking away at these jackrabbits. Remember, this is in South Texas and jackrabbits are very common in that area. They were that year. And it got to the point that the area around the runway, it was grassy and it was basically desert plains. And Bruce in his big land yacht of a Buick, he could drive on that with no problem. So we got either Jim or Kelly laying down on the roof of this land yacht Buick while myself and the other guy would hold the guy's back leg so that when we went around a corner, he wouldn't slide off and fall on the ground. And he'd be sitting on the top of that car uh, aiming at these jackrabbits. And we actually wound up shooting maybe a dozen of these things. And, oh, man, aren't we great? Well, this really wasn't the best idea, and I definitely would not be doing that today. But we just thought that was really good, and uh, Kelly, or maybe it was Jim, they thought it would be a good idea to take trophies. We each got a rabbit foot, and then they cut off some ears, and they were going to take them back. I have no clue what they were going to do with them. And just like everybody else that age, something you think is a good idea, it turns out in the long run, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. But anyway, we got about halfway back to Laredo Air Force Base, heading home from uh, Barfly, and we started thinking, you know, there's a bunch of dead rabbits laying by the runway at Barfly. Come Monday morning, there's going to be people flying around Barfly. When you have dead rabbits laying on the ground, what do you think is going to happen to the vulture population over Barfly? Now, South Texas is not only a home to a lot of jackrabbits, it's also a home to a lot of vultures, buzzards. 
And we started thinking, you know, having the buzzards circle around over barfly where there's airplanes in the pattern is not exactly conducive to good flying and safe flying. So we turned around and we went back to barfly and I'm pretty sure we found all of those dead rabbits and we put them in the trunk of Bruce's land yacht and we drove about 40 miles away and we found a ditch out in the middle of nowhere and we put these dead rabbits in the ditch and then we went home. So at least we had that level of responsibility. But now you know about the great barfly rabbit hunt near Laredo, Texas in the year of 1970. I hope you enjoyed this story just as a kind of a fun story. It's a piece of history. It's a piece of Air Force history in the 1970 era around Laredo. So if you enjoyed it, give me that thumbs up. It'll tell me and it'll also tell YouTube that you enjoyed it and you thought they should recommend it to other people. Leave me a comment down in the comment section. Let me know what you thought of this video, whether you just thought it was great or you thought it was blah or any of these other things. And if you're a subscriber already, thank you so much. I appreciate every single one of you. If you're not, then please right now, go ahead and click that subscribe button and YouTube and then the bell icon. And then YouTube will notify you whenever I post another really good vlog and tutorial right here on David's Tutorials. Take care, everybody. Have yourself an absolutely wonderful day.